Uh, thank you, Dr. Curtis, for joining us. We really appreciate that, especially for the time difference between uh, Israel and where you are. So I will give a small introduction about you and then uh, we will be very happy to hear you. So uh, Dr. Kurt Bonk is a professor of instructional system technology at, in, at Indiana University, where he teaches psychology and technology courses. From 2012 to 2018, uh, Dr. Bonk has been annually named by Education Next and listed in Education Week among the top contributors to the public debate about education from more than 20,000 university-based academics. In 2020, Kurt was awarded uh, the IU President's Award for Excellence in Teaching and Learning Technology. His research focuses on emerging learning technologies, online and blended learning, MOOCs and open education, and global impacts from collaborative technology. So it's uh, our honor uh, to listen to your uh, talk. So please. Thank you, Aaron, for introducing me. I thank you for my friends, Rafi and Miriam and Amiri and Ellie. Uh, for showing up today and all the rest of you. Uh, I'm amazed at all the people that are here, 166. So um, I still have, when I keynoted the Moffitt conference 10 years ago, I still have my flash memory stick. So Ellie, I'm expecting to get a flash memory stick in the mail, I'll keep forever. <laughs> this morning, I was hanging out with the fish in Northwest USA in Washington and Oregon. I was just hanging out there and I took a plane from Oregon to Seattle and on to Indiana. And now I'm going east some more and over to Israel. So I'm ending up, I keep going east all day. <laughs> I've not been to bed for a while. I woke up at four o'clock this morning to go running because uh, I've run 466 days in a row. I'm trying to get to 500. So we'll see if I make it or not. Now the topic today is blended learning and uh, you know, We've been talking about blended on and off for more than two decades. I've been teaching blended since 1993. And my, my handbook of blended learning came out in 2006 when I visited Israel and got the chance to, to meet Rafi personally, one-to-one, -one, and go to the University of Tel Aviv and go to the Open University there. But a lot has happened since this handbook of blended learning came out in 2006. And we had chapters from around the world, including one from Rafi and David there in, in Israel. But, um, you know, today we're coming back to this notion that how, how important blended learning is because we're in this post, maybe post-COVID world in Israel and the U.S. The rest of the world's still in a COVID world, right? And so we're seeing these reports come out saying blended is the the next thing. Well, it's been the next thing for three decades, you know, and so we should know something about how to set up, establish a quality blended environment. And so I'm going to talk about two models or frameworks that I've been using for a while to help me create a blended learning approach. But there are new models, as I said, emerging today, including one from a former student of mine called High, high Flex Model, and I'll talk about that. So let me see if I can share my slides. I think I have permission to do so. Uh, and yes, I do. And um, give me a thumbs up if you can see that. We got a thumbs up. Okay, great. Uh, so, you know, you can download these slides. There's nothing secretive about these. You can go to a website I call trainingshare.com. Trainingshare, one word, dot com. You can have all my talks. You can have all my papers at publication share because you have to believe in the power of sharing, right? We all should share what we do. And so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about current trends. I mean, as I said, in the news this month are a lot of articles talking about how colleges have to move to hybrid approaches. We might in fact have hybrid colleges that were once online that add face-to-face -face components and those that were fully online adding online were having this hybridization of learning take place all around the world. And there's a new report that's just come out from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and some other folks have 
titled this um, planning a blended future. They're planning a blended future and they're thinking about what are the, the ways, the mechanisms that combine technological space, the temporal space, the pedagogical space, and spa there are four dimensions in here, pedagogical, spatial, temporal, and technological. And they talk about whether synchronous environments or asynchronous or a blended environment provides different aspects of each of those four approaches. And this report is free for anyone to download. You can get my slides and just click on the link and get it. For instance, if you create a program, your program might emphasize face-to-face -face courses in the first year, might increasingly have online or blended courses in the second, third, and fourth year. As one moves through their program, they might increasingly have a blended learning experience. For those students who started last year during COVID panic in the pandemic, they probably had a pretty much an online experience in year one, unlike this chart showing up here. So how do we combine different aspects and supports for our students? How do we com combine rich open educational resources with authentic assessments, with scaffold gu scaffolded guides for students to help them proceed through their programs? This particular report talks all about that. And you know, we've got, every year we got new books at the K-12 space talking about blended learning. We've got higher ed books coming out talking about blended learning. And we've got tons and tons and tons of research talking about blended learning. <laughs> Going crazy talking about blended learning. Let's try and make sense of it and where we're, what's gonna be happening in 2021, 2022, 2023. One approach that my former student, Brian Beatty has designed that's, that's gotten a lot of acclaim during the past year is called the high flex model. High flex model, combining hybrid learning or blended and flexibility. And he's got a free book on the high flex model. So I put the link to my book that's free in the chat. This is a second book that's free and maybe, um, Miriam, if you could access this, um, this link and you can put the chat in the, in the chat or if Ellie could put in the chat the link here, um, he talks about how we can combine the two together. So high flex stands for a combination of hybrid, alternating face-to-face -face and remote learning and flexibility, meaning students can move from one to another. You could be online one week and the next week be face-to-face -face or vice versa. I'm gonna be using this approach in my fall class and I've used it in many classes before. Faculty around the US were complaining about this model because it is more work. It provides more options for students, but it requires the faculty member to plan and set up ahead of time. It's something you might consider. I'm not necessarily saying you have to do the high flex model. High flex courses are both delivered in person as well as online at the exact same time. So for any given meeting, some students, as I said, participate in person, some come online because of the technologies enable us to do it today, which they didn't necessarily enable us to do 15 or 20 years ago. Some people during the past year got frustrated with Zoom, got totally, um, inundated with requests to teach online through a synchronous means. And it be can become rather frustrating for many. Other faculty found it was a brilliant new avenue to teach their students. Some see it as a silver lining for learning. And I've started a webcast during the past year that Ellie appeared on back in July called Silver Lining for Learning. Every Saturday, we have a show talking about new models of education. So some people look at the pandemic as promoting new forms of instruction, encouraging instructors to think differently in ways they hadn't done before. And again, each of these articles, I have the link up, you can read about them. This was in the Chronicle of Higher Education earlier this month. Just getting teachers, faculty members, students and others to talk about their instruction is something new. So the pandemic got us thinking, got us collaborating and faculty are starting to build confidence in their online 
courses, in their blended courses. And there's no going back again. Now that people have dipped their toe in the water, are trying it out, there's no heading back. But how can we get training for such approaches? As I said, you might come to my weekly podcast show called Silver Lining for Learning. You might go to Contact North in Ontario, Canada, which has free webinars all the time, every week on blended learning, on synchronous learning, on using Zoom, how to make Zoom um, engaging for your students. They have a, a series of webinars by some of the foremost e-learning pioneers in the world, including Tony Bates from Vancouver, Ron Osten from York University in Canada, and, and George Valexianos from Vancouver Island. They have them all come in and they're free to attend. Now it's not just Contact North that's providing these. The Commonwealth of Learning out of, the, out of Vancouver has free teacher training webinars or MOOCs. And so if you go to col.org, commonwealthoflearning.org, you will find a whole series of courses and programs that are provided by Athabasca University in Canada and the, the Commonwealth of Learning combined, where they're teaching teachers, they're, they're trained the trainer, teaching teachers how to teach online. So that's a second place that you can go for free webinars. Contact North, teachonline.ca slash webinars. So if, if, if you didn't catch all these, write me an email. I promise I will respond within 24 hours. I wanna talk about my two models, um, one being the tech variety model that I said, we have a free book that's available that you might be able to download right now and read. Uh, we've had about 300,000 people download that book already. Each letter there on the side in red spells tech variety, tone, encouragement, curiosity, variety, autonomy, relevance, interactivity, engagement, tension, and yielding products. Those are the motivational principles that are tried and true. They've been tested for decades. And what I've done is assembled them into an acronym that spells tech variety in a simple mnemonic. And so some examples of tech variety include creating a safe climate for students to learn, a psychologically safe climate. And one way to do that is to do introductions to one another using the tools that are out there. Myself, I didn't do a, as good a job as I could have using Zoom the first year and use, utilizing the breakout rooms to have students to share their findings, their results, their um, interests, their expectations. You can get students to discuss things in small teams in a breakout room and then bring someone back to the, to the larger group as one way to have students maybe share their learning, share a link and break them out of just listening and having them engage. Another tool for this is called Flipgrid. Flipgrid is a free tool that was developed at the University of Minnesota by my friend, Dr. Charlie Miller at the University of Minnesota, where they talk funny up there, yeah. Anyhow, Microsoft saw that millions of teachers around the world were using Flipgrid. Flipgrid allows you to do video discussions or um, post one and a half minute videos of you commenting on a question or an issue. And it's threaded so you can listen to and watch other people discuss issues. And so it's one thing I've used, that's my class right there. I used it for my class to introduce themselves. I used it with my class to discuss articles. Microsoft has embedded in their products for free. All of you can download and use it for free today. About one teacher every 10 seconds was using Flipgrid during the, pan the early days of the pandemic. Maybe one out of every five were signing up to use Flipgrid. A tool that I started using recently is called Jamboard, which is provided free from Google. It enables us, my, my, I have a team right now doing some visioning for where Indiana needs to go in the future in the School of Education. We're using Jamboard for brainstorming activities and then for just wraparound discussion activities. 
and having little sticky notes like using um, Padlet and other tools out there. Speaking of Padlet, my colleague, Dr. Hijung An in New Jersey at William Patterson University has students record idioms like bite the bullet, break a leg, better late than never involving their heritage and putting art behind it and posting their idioms within this tool called Padlet. It's basically an online note-taking or sticky note on a wall approach to getting ideas, generating ideas, brainstorming ideas, getting ideas out on a virtual napkin, if you will. Another tool that builds a psychologically safe climate is called Slido. Slido lets students rank and rate questions or comments on a scale and the, the highest ranked answers or comments or questions float to the top. And Slido is a free tool, it's a freemium tool. You get the first part free. Um, if you do more polling and other things, then it, it moves into a paid tool. But I've seen this used around the world, uh, Slido, to engage students because it's anonymous. You don't know whose ideas you're voting on. And so it gives people some anonymity um, and respect for their ideas. Another free tool gets us at the second. So the first one was toner climate of the 10 principles. The second is um, encouragement or feedback of the tech variety model. And here we use a tool called Vocaro, which is voice activated. I put on a headset and talk and students can hear the feedback that they get. They're sent a URL um, that they play. And that's instead of typing the feedback to the students, you can talk or speak the feedback. And this tool, I think, has unlimited number of minutes that you can record. Yet another free tool for blended learning approaches. So this is another blended learning approach. This one in particular, people use Quizlet. It's the largest quizzing system in the world. Um, so you can use pre-packaged quizzes on the web or develop your own or a combination thereof because students like to self-test. They like to see if they know the content. And so Quizlet becomes a safe way in which they can test before taking the real exam, the quote unquote real exam. So they can get more confidence, if you will. Another way to build in encouragement or feedback into an online class is to recruit volunteers. I often recruit volunteers who are former students who have graduated and finished the class to come back as my assistants or my TAs within the class. Stanford has taken this model and, and exploded it. They're teaching a course, a course on coding with 900 volunteer teachers, 900. It's a totally new model. They have 10,000 students in the class from 120 countries. This started in three months ago in March. I've written to them to find out more. I'm waiting to get a response. The course is called Code in Place. So they're teaching coding or computer coding by having an army of volunteer teachers as supports. It's an interesting approach or a model. I'm trying to get them to appear on Silver Lining for Learning, my podcast show. Another interesting approach is the Khan Academy, which many of you know, Salman Khan built um, to train his nephews and nieces in geometry and algebra. And then his, his lectures went viral. And because they were so popular, Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation gave him like $10 million to build out the platform and have assessments that are with artificial intelligence wrapped around them and personalization of instruction wrapped around it. So personalized learning, customized learning is embedded in the Khan Academy. So you can use Khan Academy content to supplement your classes. That would be a blend. To use existing content, to have students use these um, instructional aids, maybe use a MOOC, other online courses to supplement one's learning or have tutorials using Jing, Screener, or whatever, recording your voice, talking your students through a website or a new technology tool or whatever the tutorial you have or building, 
provides encouragement for your students. The third principle of the tech variety model is curiosity. Curiosity is the most downloaded chapter in the free book. You can download those chapters individually, one by one by one, or download the entire book. This chapter is the most downloaded, other than the very ending, which is at the end, we have all the web links that you can download uh, for the book. To build curiosity, often I use to this, this month's news, something that's happened in the news to excite my students into my psychology classes, into my technology classes. So if you're teaching paleontology, every day there's a new dinosaur being discovered and you can provide those multimedia news articles or reports for your students. Um, just this week, there was a article I read about uh, a giant, <laughs> a giant living. We've got some people in the background. Um, we've got an article about a 100-year-old uh, fish that lives to be 100 years old that's pregnant for five years. Imagine that. Um, so, if you're teaching um, science classes, if you're teaching geology classes, if you're teaching history classes, there's a plethora of content available from the BBC, from CNN, from all around the world that you can find out about experiments that are taking place in Massachusetts on cuttlefish and get students excited about science STEM in effect. The fourth principle of the tech variety model gets us into variety, novelty, fun, and fantasy. Um, and so you might have students who are getting involved in project-based learning, uh, problem-based learning, where they're building um, products out and they're having reports that are with tools out there like Animaker, like Canva, where they can have some power or some respect for their products that they're producing. They're, they might be creating a game for the class. They might be creating an animation for the class. My student here it created a what we have in the US called Jeopardy game to test each other on learning theories. And there's a free tool called Jeopardy Rocks, which lets students create these quizzes on the internet. Another tool called random.org enables me to randomize who's going to present in class, what order they're gonna present in, what items on my agenda am I going to cover? Random.org has dice that, might, that we might throw, has a coin that we might flip, has a countdown clock to let students present in front of class for only so many minutes, or only so many seconds. It enables me to try something new out. I once taught a class in reverse order from the end of the module back to the beginning module because I found I was getting boring teaching the same way over and over and over. Random.org lets me be more spontaneous than I was. Another tool for variety I've used is called Kahoot, which is built by a computer science professor in Norway. Kahoot's a tool which lets students use their mobile devices, their mobile phones, so that um, they can enter in their mobile. My mobile's behind me being charged. I forgot about that. So my mobile's being charged, but my students can enter a fictional name or a real name if they want to and answer the questions. And as they do, they accumulate points. And the, the students get so enamored by this, they all want their picture underneath the, the screen that says who won if they're the winner or come in second place. Kahoot's a really engaging way to review content. I'm not suggesting that you, you um, utilize it all the time, but it's really a, a way to get students to do some drills, some basic facts. Um, if you're teaching some, some um, uh, basic terminology, if you will. A tool that you might not have heard about is called futureme.org. Futureme.org lets your students write to themselves in the future. They write an email to themselves maybe at, for the end of the semester, like what they're going to accomplish in my class. They write, they write and jot it down. I use Future Me at the beginning of my summer break 
and I send it to the end of my summer break as a way to reflect on whether I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. So it's a way for students to reflect, reflect, reflect. Um, another thing that I do in my class is I have my students as an option enroll in a massive open online class or a MOOC. And if they do all the assignments in the MOOC and can show me a certificate of completion, they can delete any assignment they want in my class. That, that will count as one of their assignments. And so in effect, I have them taking two classes, my class and the massive open online class at the same time. So they're getting double the exposure to the content this way. If they, they have to fill out a reflection paper that they, that what, of what they learned, if they complete it, they can, they can eliminate a final assignment. If they just take part of the MOOC, they can eliminate a midterm assignment. There are tons of these things. In fact, there are over 14,000 MOOCs now on A to Z, but this woman here has the largest class out there. She's had 3.4 million students in her course on happiness from Yale University or the Science of Wellbeing course. Um, I often will bring guests into my class. As I said, I have a show called Silver Lining for Learning, which Ellie appeared in and my friend Mary Schoenfeld appeared in, um, who runs the Moffat Institute. Um, we have a weekly guests coming in and they're saved. There's a whole, there's 66 episodes so far and counting. I have my students reflect on the videos for themes. They can do an assignment reflecting on existing content, looking for themes, patterns, concepts, and then um, uh, summarizing all of them as an assignment. Reflection is extremely important for learning, but I give them a choice. So number five is choice, autonomy and choice. Okay, um, they might look at a famous person in biography.com um, like John Muir, an environmentalist or an ecologist in the US. They might pick a famous woman in science or a NASA uh, space astronaut. They, they can track the life of a scientist in Twitter or in biography.com or many ways. Now, often my students will say this to me and I'm not so sure, Miriam, if they said this to you, but Miriam was in my class a decade ago, and she might remember this. They would say, Dr. Bonk, your assignments are too easy. Let me make it harder. And so they'll say, I don't want to do a, a glossary for your, for your class. I want to do a multimedia glossary. I want to have videos and announcements and audio podcasts linked to terminology. And my students will do these really grand multimedia glossaries for my class with pictures, animations, and they're learning much more content that way. I also bring in experts like the gentleman in the upper left there, his name is Dr. Mike Melinda. He created the class I'm teaching. He created it 40 years ago and he's retired. And I bring him back to the class to talk to my students about the purpose of the class, why it exists. And I bring my former student from Thailand comes back into the class a colleague from Stanford. Every week I have a different person who comes into the class. I mentioned Charlie Miller built Flipgrid. He's the person in the left there, the second, he's in the middle, second from the left. Um, I brought in a colleague who created the famous Plato program at the University of Illinois. Dr. Marty Siegel came into my class last year, just before he retired. So every week I'm bringing some, this gentleman took 500 MOOCs in, uh, Kenya, and I brought him in to talk about what it was like, or in Nigeria, I take that back, talking about taking those MOOCs. One of my colleagues teaches um, in the medical school, and he teaches anatomy and physiology classes. He has cases that he's built that has patient cases, someone with a chest pain, someone with a lump in her breast, different um, scenarios or cases that students have to solve. They get blood pressure, they get heart rate, they get temperature, they get all sorts of uh, data and blood slides that they have to analyze. It takes them about seven hours to create a case, but they're all free to use. So if you teach anatomy or physiology, these cases are free on the web from Mark, Dr. Mark Braun. Some people have students edit Wikipedia pages as an activity. 
to get to learn the content. That's one way to blend, to make it meaningful for students or to write a wiki book. As Miriam knows, I had my students create books on the web, create a wiki book on different topics. Some students, number seven, gets that interactive and collaborative. Um, and so some students take advantage of using a free tool called Trello. Trello is a project management tool that the instructor can see the progress of each team and what aspects of the project they're having difficulty with or obstacles that they're facing. So it's a team management tool uh, and a list making application to organize teamwork. I'll skip over that. Another way for number seven interactivity and collaboration is to use tools like Google Documents or Meeting Words or Now Comment. There are tools that enable each person to have their contribution. And in the case of meeting words, their color of their contribution is a different color for each person on the team. Nuclino is a tool I used last year, which let my students debate ideas with another university at the same time. So a, co a colleague of mine in Detroit was her students were debating articles that they are reading with my students using Nuclino. Nuclino is like a wiki. The problem with it, it's, it's, it's free, but the problem with it is people could erase it and then you lose all your work. So you have to be careful using this tool, but it's a free tool. I'm playing around and liked it. It enables team to do article debates in effect um, or chapter debates or chapter summaries. Another tool is called Thing Link, and Thing Link lets students um, direct students from a map, from an information page, to um, the an assignment, to a syllabus, to a video, to a map, and this is it? free as well. <laughs> One tool that that you can use are timelines, like the British Museum. They have dates on a timeline. You can call it different artifacts in time at the British Museum. By clicking on different links, you can call it up and get information on it. You can scroll through the years or through the decades or through centuries of time, going back hundreds of years, thousands of years in time to look at artifacts from 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. There are also our tools that enable students to have um, math, science, biology, chemistry, labs, little micro worlds or simulations. That, for, that are free from the University of Colorado, looking at sound and waves, uh, thermodynamics, electricity, magnets, and so forth. That is called phet.edu or phet.colorado.edu. So there are a lot of these tools for simulations, a lot of tools for timelines, getting students more engaged in the content. I'm going to skip over some of this for the sake of time. I notice we have about five minutes left, Ellie. Is that right? Yeah, five to yeah, five to ten. Five to ten. Thank you. So one of my one tool that you might find interesting was developed by my friend Paul Kim at Stanford, and I mentioned him earlier. Um, he's built a tool called Smile, Stanford Mobile Inquiry Learning Environment. Smile. Now he built Smile Up. What SMILE does is it lets students create questions and it analyzes the level of questions that's being asked. It will also generate questions at different levels, five different levels, not six levels like Bloom's Taxonomy. And it's built on artificial intelligence or AI with millions of questions in the database. And it enables kids to engage in the content. And it can be used with elementary students, high school students, college students, and Paul's been going around the world, in fact, with my son with him. And he's been to Israel, in fact. Um, he's been to Palestine, in fact. He's been to um, uh, Rwanda, to Dominican Republic, to Honduras, to Thailand, having kids um, get engaged in, in their learning by having them type questions for each other on their mobile devices and seeing who can ask the most difficult questions. Uh, so number nine is challenge, having a challenge, having a tension, having a, um, having a, a, a contest, having students use Padlet to, to, to write the, the most creative question, the most um, 
difficult challenge. Number 10, the final one, gets us at databases. So students might create a database in a tool called Pinterest um, or some other tool out there. And my students really like creating summaries or, or databases of the articles in my class. Because I as Miriam knows, I tend to assign a lot of articles. <laughs> and they're all free, all available in my 100 page, Miriam, it's a 100 page syllabus now. It's no longer 33 pages. Uh, and my students try and make sense of all the articles using Pinterest out there. Uh, and so uh, that's one option. Another thing my students will do in the discussion forums is they'll create a mind map of the discussion to try and help students visualize the discussion and see the causal relations in and among the discussion that's happened within the class. Another thing my students do as a final project is use a tool called Canva. I think the, the woman who built it's in Australia. Uh, Canva is an, uh, an online design program that doesn't require much design skills, but creates really slick, really engaging infographics, PowerPoints, flyers, brochures. And so students can feel you know, really proud of their products. They can show their parents what they did and their grandparents and their classmates and so forth. And my students love using Canva. So those are the 10 principles of the tech variety model. In the chat window, I want you to write which of those principles, or maybe better yet, which idea that you heard you think you might be able to use. I'm going to briefly talk about the R2D2 model so you can see what it's about. I'm going to skip over some things so you can see a bit of the second model. It's got a, a book called Empowering Online Learning, uh, but it's not free. So I present the one that's free first. Uh, so in the chat window, either put down which of those 10 principles or maybe both, which of the 10 principles and which idea did you like or could you use? So the second model is called R2D2. And I brought, I thought I had my, here he is. I brought Yoda with me to help me out with R2D2, my little flash memory stick. <laughs> Um, so Ellie, I'm expecting you to send me a, some, something like this in mail. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and so there's a model. There's, it's a problem solving wheel. Some people see it as a learning style model, but I'm a former educational psychologist. I'm also a former CPA. <laughs> Our educational psychologists know that learning styles don't hold up, but Learning styles make a lot of sense as an instructor to reflect on your teaching, to think about your diverse learners in your classroom, to think about addressing diversity. Some people like hands-on doing, some people like visualization, others like to read, still others like to reflect. So my colleague, Ka Jang from Wayne State and I did a book called the, the Empowering Online Learning Book. And so, the first one is auditory or verbal learners, written, written expressions, podcast shows that they might listen to or create, blogs that they might read or create, Twitter feeds that they might follow someone in or they might create their own Twitter feeds, open access articles that they can read from. Again, number one is reading verbal information or write your own books, create a free journal or free book or whatever. So it can involve pa more passive learning or active learning, depending upon what you want them to do. Last semester, I had students creating their own blogs. Instead of doing discussion forums, I had them do it in small teams of four. Each team was giving feedback to their members of the team. And so the second part is observational learning, observing, watching, viewing, and so forth. It involves reflecting on big questions, having students produce big questions. In fact, there's a website called BQO, Big Questions Online. You want your students engaged in the content, reflecting on the content, interpreting infographics, interpreting information, doing inferencing, de deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, creating infographics. Some professors are now, in, in the US at least, I don't know if in Israel, 
they're creating syllabi that's an infographic, a visualization of the syllabus, of the content, of the information. Young people today, millennial learners, don't like to read my 100-page syllabus. They like to read the summary overview. Some students like to have a dialogue, like to have video discussions. They have a discussion forum underneath the video content. This was created at Teachers College Columbia in New York City. You might look up dialogues. Some students like role play or debate online. And so I might give my students different roles to play like question asker, coach, idea generator, um, uh, reflection person, artist, um, uh, optimist, pessimist. So everyone has a different role to play. They might sign up for a role or they might be assigned a role. And so the third is animation. The third is visualization, timelines, taxonomies, uh, film, diagrams. So when COVID st first sprung up, Stanford Medical School created a animation video to teach about sanitation, to teach about germ spreading and whatnot, short little videos, engagement. There's a free tool on the web called World Mapper, which <clears throat> shows you um, data, databases on a world map. So it might be looking at um, COVID deaths on a world map as such as this early in, during COVID, where was it exploding? They might look at pancreatic cancer deaths. They might look at public school spending. Um, all sorts of information can be looked at in this way. Births per thousand people, birth rates, for instance, uh, poverty. They can look at all things at the World Mapper website. Tools for visualization are exploding today. Lucid is one um, website that you might go to, Lucid for Education. I mentioned earlier Jamboard. Another tool is called Mira. There are many of these tools that enable us to look at, for instance, 3D data, uh, word clouds, to see word, um, information visualized in a, word, in a word cloud, to see which terms you're using more than others, if you will. There are tools called WordSif, Worded Out, Tezito, and so forth. A popular trend in the US and all around the world is to draw one's talk. So when I'm presenting, you, someone might be drawing my talk out. So you can see a visualization of it. Thank you so much. So the fourth one and final one is tactile learning. Games, simulations, dance, having a gallery of students prior work to look at. When students get worried about your class, get nervous, you can show them the gallery of prior work, what the students did last semester as a way to reduce their tension in the class. Instead of just listening to podcast shows, they can produce a podcast show or produce a video demonstration or produce a website. Instead of just exploring a website, have them do something, engage in the content. One of my students last semester had her students create an open textbook and every student was in charge of a different chapter and she teaches language education. So I think that's the last example I have up here. Um, as Rafi knows, I had a book that came out in 2009 called The World is Open. And so when I travel around the world, I bring my camera with me and I have everybody go like this and put their arms up in the air. And so um, I'm gonna stop for a second and see if I can get a picture of everybody like this. So everyone can put your arms up in the air and I'm gonna, the world is open for all of us. Okay, very good. Okay, great, great. All right, well that's, okay. Uh, this, is, this is a smart group, Belly. I didn't, you didn't, you told me, yeah. Uh, so, unfortunately, we, we go back down to the beginning. Okay, let's see if I can call this up. Okay. There we are. Just at the end here. So I've had people all around the world from Bangkok, from Singapore, from Indiana, from Illinois, from China. You can see they're just staring at me. Um, but we're at a jumping off point. We're going a jumping off point to something new. So if I could have everyone stand with me, stand up.
and all the all the men jump at the count of three. One, two, three, jump. One, two, three, jump. All the women, one, two, three, jump. Together, one, two, three, jump. One more time. Okay, you can have a seat. Uh, we're in a jumping off point into something new. COVID has pushed us in all new ways. We're testing all these ideas out there, whether it's tech variety, R2D2, high flex model, whatever model of blended learning. There are, there are many models I didn't present today, but things are heating up. Things are heating up for all of us. Blended learning is coming within reach for all of us, but I need your help. So on the count of three, can you all say, I cannot do this alone? One, two, three. I cannot, I cannot do, do this alone. Do this alone. One, two, three. I cannot, I cannot, do, cannot do this alone. alone. I cannot do this alone. Cannot do this alone. One, two, three. I cannot do this alone. Okay. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully you can all make this so and try this out in your own classes. Some of the ideas, not all of them. My notes are at trainingshare.com. My papers are at uh, publication share. Free book at Tech Variety. <laughs> so write to me if you have any questions. My email's up there. And make it so. Mm -hmm. So make it so. Move on and make it so. Uh, Ellie, you want to yeah. take over? Yeah. Th thank you very much, Bert. Yeah. Those some um, here. Um, any? We have a minute or two for questions. So if uh, anyone like to ask question, please mm -hmm. open. You can open the. You can open the. Yeah, I'll stop the sharing here at this point. Yeah. I, I have a question, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's uh, you opened us uh, in a concentrated, concentrated way uh, a new world of games. Okay, now within the academy, it reminds me that uh, the young, young lecturers and old lecturers. Okay, in the not always it's a. Uh, in their chronological age, but maybe in their mentality. And it reminds me the saying that you can't teach old dog new tricks. <laughs> and so how do you find it in your place where you know so many tricks and how the lecturers surrounding you uh, accept it? How, what is the penetration rate of such new uh, games to the other people lecturing, which are not so in favor of this new world. Yeah, so in the, in the free book, there's a chapter on helping resistant um, instructors. And there are 10 ideas that I, I put in there in terms of what supports that can be provided for those people who weren't trying. Um, but what's happened at Indiana and at many places is 20 years ago, there was more hesitancy than there is today. That you have to have a systemic approach. There has to be modeling. There has to be buy-in from the top. The, the dean, for instance, has to try this out in his classes or her classes and role model. You have to have celebrations for people who are utilizing some of these techniques. So as you notice, I, I was lucky to get a president award for teaching with technology. So there is some incentive. There has to be some showcasing. We have a, a annual day where the faculty showcase what they're doing with technology in our student union. There are incentives that build in, but it's not just one approach. Um, you, you have to build in many, many prongs, many prongs to, um, to change the la language, to change the, the, the lingua that's uh, about technology. So the people previously who are downplaying it actually become the leaders, right? That's what the goal, that's what the goal should be. Um, and that's what's happened. So um, other, any other comment or question? Yeah. Malka, you asked for... Yes, I, I, I would like to ask a question. It's incredible how much you do, but it's very difficult to guide and to do all these things, I don't know how to write um, 
a book or posters or flyers, uh, you need to guide them. And it, how can you cope with, with all this? Uh, how can you them more? Okay, that's a great question. It's more important, I mean, how can you co how can you guide them and help them? Couple, there's a couple of advices. One, only try one or two new things each semester. Don't do all that. Yeah. Just try one or two things. Two, talk to your students before you try and say, I'm, I have these ideas. Which of these would you like to, one or two would you like to try? And are any of you experts with this technology who would like to be my assistant and like to help me out? I'll give you two bonus points or you can delete one of the assignments if you wanna be my assistant this semester. Or three, you ask a student who already graduated from your class to come back and help you out the next time. This semester, I asked two people to come back and help me out, okay? So the, it's not just me. I make it a, I treat the, many of them as colleagues that I'm learning from my students they can teach me how to use, but I only try one or two new things out and I try and plan it out ahead of time. The, when you teach or embed technology, there's more time on the front end before you teach, less time once you get started. You know, it's just before the semester starts, you have to start planning some of that. Um, so that uh, it's over time. And then, okay, the first time it might not work well, but often you just change one thing and it works really well. So don't give up if it doesn't work once, but maybe you give up if it doesn't work twice. <laughs> so try it twice. I, I recommend you always try something new twice because you'll be amazed at the first time, God, I couldn't believe it just didn't work. The second time you just amazed how well it worked, you know, so, so trust me on that one. And also you might have discussions within your department or have a colleague that you go to lunch with and say, this is what I'm working on. This is the idea I have. Can you give me feedback on them? So there's a combination of, of ideas or methods out there. So I guess we've run out of time, Ellie. Yeah, I wanna thank you all thank for coming and, and staying a little extra with me today. I respond via email. It's so great to be back in Israel, to have been in Washington and Oregon this morning and Indiana tonight. Uh, thank, thank you very much for, for a great you. talk. I know it's in the middle of the night for you, so it's, um, we appreciate that. Um, so thank you. We'll now move to the second part of the conference. We will have a short break. Thank you.